anyway, it ends up, it goes on, and uh, they, somebody, you know, they call the police, and my mom <laughs> and this woman end up in the back of a, a police car, they're separate ones, of course. <laughs> and they're questioned, and, and, and you know, clearly the police just didn't want to deal with the paperwork that was dealing <laughs> with two moms arguing. And, uh, but the funny thing was, you know, we went home that night, my father came home from dinner, and he said, anything happened today? She goes, no. <laughs> And so that was sort of the chaos that I dealt with in the house. So uh, now I'm going to read a short passage where I sort of tie that in for how my mother could be very protective. And I tie that into later on down the line. And on the radio show back in the, in, in the 80s, one of the, you know, we all sort of play characters on the show. And one of the things they always used to make fun of me was that I had bad breath. And it started out as a joke more about that I was Italian and it became garlic breath and that would be the joke. And then it became, I smoked at the time, I drank coffee, and I'm sure that on some mornings, I did have some, you know, some breath that wasn't that good. So they would berate me on the air about it. And I was a good sport. I could take it. I knew it was all good fun. And this one particular day, they had, they had, you know, were really sort of beating away on it to the point where Howard's mother even called. And she's like, you know, you're, you're being so mean to this young boy. You know, you realize he's got a mother. And so, so I'm going to pick it up here. So, so, uh, uh, okay, so... Um, his mother called up and she said, uh, uh, let me tell you something. He, he said to his mother, let me tell you something, Mom. We work with this guy every day. And she said, I know you do, and he's wonderful. That's, <laughs> that's, what, I, that's what I hear. And this is the way you show your love? If anyone did this to you, Howard, you would hit the ceiling. Mommy, they took a poll, or four out of five dentists says he doesn't own a toothbrush. <laughs> it's the worst smelling orifice on his body. And if I don't tell him, who's going to tell him? <laughs> Gary, don't you appreciate this? <laughs> no, I said, because I, I don't believe it. How could you do this to Gary, Howard's mom said. He's so devoted to you. I'm doing it out of love. How do you think his mother's going to feel? <laughs> and that's where I pick it up in the book. We'll soon find out. Because when I got home later that day, Howard called. I was watching Jeopardy, which I watch every day. I'm a trivia genius, after all. <laughs> how are you doing, he said to me. Howard didn't ever call to ask me how I was doing. OK. Were you OK with today? Yeah. Actually, I hadn't given it any thought. He'd been making fun of me for years. He never apologized. I'm sorry if I was too hard on you this morning. Howard, what is this all about? Your mother called me. <laughs> she was very upset. And then my mother called me and said, I better call you and apologize. I'm sorry. I was mortified. Whose mother calls their boss's mother? <laughs> All I wanted to do was get her off the phone with him so I could call my mom and ask her, what the fuck was she doing? <laughs> Howard didn't know anything about how I grew up or my mom's tendency for outbursts, her history of depression. Suddenly I was 10 years old again, remembering how anxious I got when she and I were out in public. Would she lose it? Would someone be asking me the next day if she was crazy? Was Gary's crazy mom going to be a recurring bit on the show? And then I realized there was something worse. My mom calling the office every day to yell at someone, like she used to do to my dad's secretary, co-workers, and boss. I decided I needed to show her that I was a big boy and I didn't need coddling. And in a way, I wanted her to hear that calling my boss's mom made things worse for me, not better. So I said, Howard, listen, tomorrow I want you to hammer me as hard as you ever have. He had no problem with that. After we were married, I called my mom. Mom, you gotta be kidding. You can't do that. I'm a grown up. I have my own apartment. I live in Manhattan. I know, she said, but you sounded so upset. That's the show I started yelling. Why wouldn't you call me, not her? I was really angry, not just because of what she did, but because I wanted to be clear that she was never to call my office or anyone I work with ever again. Maybe it was a singular moment of clarity for her, because I never once heard about her interfering again. But I still met, spent many months after that being wary whenever I got ripped on the show. I was never out of the woods. It reminded me of something my father always said about my mom. She does the right thing in the wrong way, and the way she does it pisses everyone off. <laughs> So uh, I go on in the book to talk about, you know, I talk about my brother and I talk about some stuff that happened on the show. And the last chapter in the book, which is actually, you know, I sent the book to my editor. My editor said, I don't like the way it ends. You need to sort of bring it back full circle. So we went back and again, for everyone who's in the room that's about my age, this is, you know, this chapter can be funny and it can be sad. And, you know, at one point, one day my parents were living in Florida, and that's a whole other story, but that's a whole part of the chapter. My parents got divorced after 43 years because they weren't sure it was working out. <laughs> and, um, and, and then they, my mother wouldn't talk to my father, and it was a whole ordeal, and then 
they started to talk, and then my father moved back in with my mother. <laughs> but they weren't really married. My kids didn't know that grandma and grandpa weren't married. It's all, it's all in here. But um, so now they're down there living in Florida, and everything's going fine. And then my dad gets sick, and um, and and pretty quickly, he was one of those guys who refused to go to the doctor. They want to go to the doctor. We back to the doctor. You know, we found out that he had cancer, and you know, six months after we found out he had cancer, he was gone. It went that quick, and then. So now my mom's living in Florida alone, and I'm up in New York, and my brother's in Texas, and you know, we're calling, and I, I'm, I'm flying down there, and I'm doing her bills electronically, because she's not to do a checkbook or any of that crap. And nine months after my father died, she's just starting to get her act together again. And I get a call that she's been in a, a, a very, very serious car accident. So she had a very bad brain injury, um, and my mom is, just so, just so you know, this isn't totally depressing. My mom's still alive. My mom was in a nursing home not far from where I live. I'm up in Connecticut. My mom was very close to me. I see her every Wednesday. I bring her a cupcake. For, we call it Cupcake Wednesday. She's got satellite radio. She listens to the Sinatra channel. She's got, you know, she, has, she has it good. But after the accident, my brother and I started to notice that something had changed about her. Something, she had gotten to be sort of very agreeable, and something was very different about her. So this is the end of the book. And, I'm going to pick it up. Uh, I'm going to pick it up right here. Uh, talked about the decision to put my mom in a nursing home. It was a gut wrenching decision, and I knew in my heart that she needed to be closer to one of us. Neither Anthony nor I could monitor whether she was getting proper care if she was down there alone. But when I told her she'd be moving to a facility near me in Connecticut, part of me felt like I was breaking bad news to a child. We're going to keep your house. It may be temporary, I said, or it may be permanent. We're going to have to wait and see. Two months earlier, she'd been completely independent, living alone, driving to do her errands, living a full, healthy life in a house of her choosing. Now she was being taken to a strange place where she lived in one room with a roommate, the exact scenario she had begged Anthony and me to avoid, but we felt like we had no other choice. Yet when I told her, she didn't resist, for which I was relieved. But I also thought she was acting strange. She'd been out of the hospital a month, and except for the flare-up with the aid, her personality had vanished. There was no pep, no anger, just placid acceptance. I called Anthony and I said, man, what's up with mom? She's not acting like herself. She's being way too nice. <laughs> he had noticed it too. While we liked it at first, the dramatic makeover was starting to freak us out. We weren't used to her being pliant. I had, spent, I had spent my life managing difficulty and rage, waiting for the mercury to get to the tip of the thermometer and explode. I braced myself for the explosion the day she moved into the home. But when I picked her up at the airport, I paid an aide to help her fly her to Florida. She was thrilled to see me, and uh, at the home, a team of people met us at the door and greeted her as if she were an arriving dignitary. Complaints were really kept to a minimum. I put Sirius in a room and showed her how to find the Sinatra station. The old audio cabinet from her house with the built-in record player fit snugly, against, fit snugly against the wall. She lined the shelves with pictures and all of that stuff went on. I'm going to skip ahead here. I had actually been worried that my mom would think the social life of the home was beneath her, but she just didn't participate in any of it. It's not that she had lost her will. She was happy, laughing, and reminiscent during our visits. She just seemed to have lost interest. Anthony and I started calling her robo -mom. <laughs> She was no longer recovering. She had changed. A couple of months after she moved into the home, we sold the house in Florida. We knew she wasn't moving back. The difference in her personality was never more obvious to me than the Memorial Day after she moved into the home. My wife and the kids and I had gone to a parade in town that morning. Afterward, I went to visit my mom. And she asked me what I had done, and I said, we went to the parade. A look crossed her face. Darkness filled her eyes that I recognized from when I was younger. I like going to parades. <laughs> I know, Mom, I said, but we were running late. I just decided it would be easier if I came to see you this afternoon. Oh, she said, OK. That was it. Before, in another more chaotic life, the answer would have been a full-throated, I like parades, too, and I'm stuck in all, here all day by myself, and you take your family to the goddamn parade and leave me here. It would have been an afternoon of guilt and bitterness. Now, it was just OK. I'll ask her now if she remembers beating our neighbor with shrubs or throwing turntables at a sales clerk. And she'll wave me off with a smile. Oh, yeah, that, as though it was a one-time incident, not the moments that shaped my life. It's times like these when I think I miss my mom. And there's the rub. I spent my entire life praying for the mom I have today, the one who doesn't cause any drama, the one who smiles and says, everything's OK. But I don't want her. The accident knocked the crazy out of her, but it also knocked out the good. She's missing the fire and spunk, wit and sarcasm that made her so great, if also volatile. I actually miss the theatrics. 
I miss hearing from you swear words so creatively that Richard Pryor would blush. <laughs> I miss the challenge of negotiating our moves, and that's why whenever I kiss her goodbye and walk out the door of her building, I thank God I grew up the way I did. Otherwise, you'd be calling someone else a <laughs> <laughs> You know, this book, this book, it's not a tell-all about the show, although some of the show is in there. It's just, it's, and I think, uh, I've gotten a lot of feedback. You know, the chapter about my brother, every single person read it said they cried. And, you know, people really have said, I, you know, I read your book and I laughed and I cried, but I think that for people around my age, this sort of strikes a chord. I think we're all, you know, we all go through the same thing. So, uh, thank you very much for your time.